The discovery of inscribed tablets and elephant pipes by members of the Davenport Academy developed into one of the major controversies in the interpretation of prehistoric America. Today we're going to start at St. Catherine's Historic District, which is located on the east side of Davenport, Iowa, and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It is location of two mansions built by two lumber barons until it became the campus of a girls' school named St. Catherine's Hall, and later as St. Catherine's School. Founded on September 24, 1884, at St. Catherine's Hall, the school opened with 20 students under the supervision of Bishop William Perry. St. Catherine's enrolled girls in kindergarten through high school, most of whom lived on campus. Buildings included St. Catherine's Hall, St. Margaret's Hall, St. Mary's Chapel, and the gymnasium. The sisters of the community of St. Mary's supervised the school from 1902 to 1943, and it was considered one of the best college preparatory schools in the country. And on cardcow.com, I found a older image where we can see the two mansions. We have one over here on the left, and the one in the middle is the second mansion, and the building on the right would be the chapel. Back on the Wikipedia, under architecture, this is very interesting, both the Cambria Place and the Renwick Mansion were designed by John C. Cochrane, who was one of Davenport's first professional architects. His most famous work was the Iowa State Capitol. And what a building the Iowa State Capitol is. The only capital with five domes. And John was quite the architect. And I do wish, perhaps, I could see some building photos. But all I can find is these men finishing up this retaining wall. Not a whole lot to see here, but just a mason vehicle driving up the steps of the Five Dome State Capitol saying hello to his friends and enjoying the beautiful day. In 1888, the Richardson Observatory was built because observatories are very important to observe the sky and what's happening above us. It was said to contain the finest telescope in Iowa. Another interesting fact, a former teacher at St. Catharines, Marion Crandall, was the first American woman killed in World War I. She had taught French at the school and went to work for the French canteen. Crandall was killed by an exploding shell in France on March 27, 1918. There is a legend in the city of Davenport that it will be spared from destruction by a tornado because of the mass mound. In 1835, after a period of intense storms, a Jesuit missionary, the Reverend Charles Van Quickenborn, SJ, led the first Christian service in what would become the city of Davenport. He erected a crucifix made from native black walnut on a crude altar placed on top of what he called a mass mound. It was located on the side of the hill on the St. Catherine's property. 
He gathered both the white settlers and the Native Americans in the region, regardless of their faith, and celebrated Mass for a week. On the last day, he held benediction of the Blessed Sacrament and blessed the area to preserve it from storms and tornadoes. Early settlers in Davenport considered the spot a sacred place, and Reverend Jam why yes, Mr. Jam, the first pastor of St. Anthony's Church in Davenport, regularly meditated at the site and was known to spend the night in prayer there before the cross, before major decisions or when problems arose. Eventually, the crucifix fell apart and was taken away. And I like to imagine Mr. Jam taking a stroll from his church right down here on Maine and traveling up to this sacred mound up at the hill at St. Catharines where a week-long mass was conducted on mass mound and on the quadcitytimes.com I found another article posted did mass mound save Davenport again the mass mound and its cross became a blessed spot the late Reverend Roland Philbrook an Episcopal minister from Davenport researched the mysterious plot for a little booklet he wrote it is the most sacred spot in Davenport if not the entire region. It continues to say at the bottom, I explored it again late Friday afternoon. As always, I never found any hint of a mound. And I too ventured to see if I could find this mound. Perhaps in order to see the mass mound, we would need to take a few steps back. And I can't help but wonder, after learning about the mound at Annie Whitmire, and the tablets found at the Cook's Farm mounds, and the mystery of the mounds that Mr. Bob Ross tends to forgotten graves in Davenport City Cemetery, what could Mass Mound potentially be covering up? Continuing on about the massive mound, it says a fire erupted at several lumber mills on July 24, 1901, in the village of East Davenport. It destroyed 20 acres of land, 250 people were left homeless, and businesses suffered 1.25 million in losses. When the fire got to St. Catharines, the wind shifted towards the river. The mass mound was credited for sparing the rest of the city. I'm here at the QuadCityTimes.com and we can see historic photos of the village of East Davenport Fire in 1901. And what a fire this was. And here we can see what the village of East Davenport looked like with it appears to be many buildings stretched out across this area. And we have a small group here of people standing and watching the smoke from the distance. And we see the slope down into the river and some telephone poles and other structures here in the distance and I believe they did a very good job at documenting and taking photos of this enormous fire that burnt down the whole East Village almost 
And I was trying to make out what this structure was right here. At first it appeared to almost be a boat crashing into the shore. But the shore actually is right here. So this is a building and we have these great poles right here. Very interesting. And fires in this area were quite common in the 1900. I'm over at riveraction.org, and it says on July 25th, 1901, Davenport was a volcano of flames. Yes, it was. The fire burned from here at the government bridge up the hillside for 10 blocks, engulfing the city's biggest lumber mill. 75 homes and a dozen small businesses. The heat was so intense it curled trolley tracks and burned fire hose lines into pieces. Some blamed the blaze on the hobos, igniting a stack of wooden shingles in the drying shed of the immense Weyhauser and Denkman lumber yards. And out of all the fire photos of the village of East Davenport, I keep coming back to this one and looking at what seems to be an enormous wall. And I'm not sure what to think of this, but I do find it very interesting. And here I am again on the QuadCityTimes.com and it says what lies below caves and tunnels under the Quad Cities. And here we have a photo. It says a limestone cavern once existed north of River Drive at Mound Street in the village of East Davenport. Some say the cave was a mine, and others say it was a natural limestone formation. It last was used to store barrels of beer for a local brewery and likely was filled in the 1950s. Who would have ever known? If we scroll down here, we can read more about this. It says, Karen Anderson has spent more than 40 years in the village of East Davenport and is a local historian and program director for the Antone LeClaire House. In addition to what she has learned about the cavern that existed along Mound Street, north of River Drive, she has personal memories of it. When I was a kid, they called it the bear's cage because of the bars they put across the front. All under Davenport is riddled with these cave systems. She keeps a file on the caves, including accounts from people who built homes in the McLeland Heights of the tunnels they discovered while digging. The bear's cage was bulldozed in 1955. Ten years later, a collapse near 11th Street resulted in the dumping of 400 truckloads of sand to backfill the resulting sinkhole. 
I'm over here at the village of eastdavenport.com and we will read some bits and pieces of his story as it continues. It says the village area was known to rivermen in the 1840s as Stubbs Eddy. For the hermit cave dweller, James R. Stubbs, who lived in a cave, in a mound, near the river. East Davenport would eventually be founded at the foot of the 18-mile upper rapids of the Mississippi River. Now controlled by the lock and dam system, the rapids were claimed to be the longest in the world. And another interesting fact is that this lock and dam, 15, which spans the river between Rock Island and Davenport, is the largest roller dam in the world. So we'll move down from the lock and dam 15 back to the East Village, which we will see right here in this area. And if we look to the right, we will see Lindsay Park. And at the corner of Lindsay Park, we see what looks to be a limestone wall. And I thought I might have a look down there to see if Mr. Stubbs or his cave remaining was still around. Unfortunately, I was not able to find the cave, but nonetheless, the rock formations are quite interesting. Let's head back here to the village, and up on the hill, we have a school. And this school, I believe to have survived the fire of 1901. And it says Pierce School number 13 is a historic building located on the east side of Davenport, Iowa, United States. Pierce School Lofts, as the building is now called, contains 41 market rate apartments. It was included as a contributing property in the village of East Davenport Historic District in 1980. The building was constructed in 1899, just two years before the Great Fire in the East Village, and it was created as School Number 13. It was one of eight schools that opened during the 30-year administration of Superintendent J.B. Young. It replaced School Number 1, which was located at Mound and 11th Streets and school number nine, located at Grand Avenue and Locust Street. The school's name was changed to Pierce in 1908. Around 1919, the Davenport schools adopted the 633 system and Pierce continued as an elementary school serving the east side of Davenport. And I was interested to what this 633 system was, and it says the new school system, which is still in use today, is based on six years of elementary school, three years of junior high school, and three years of high school. Once students reach high school, however, they may have to travel a long way, maybe an hour or more, to get to school. Interesting. The building ceased being a school in 1940. I'm over here at villageofeastdavenport.com and we will read some bits and pieces so you can get some history of this area. It says in 1828, President John Quincy Adams formally declared that all lands east of the Mississippi were to be sold to settlers gradually moving their way westward. This resulted in Indian tribes being forced to the west. Chief Black Hawk and 2,000 of his followers refused to move and the Black Hawk War resulted. The Treaty of 1836 was signed near what is now College Avenue in East Davenport, 
The treaty was an agreement between Chief Keokuk and the U.S. government in which the Indians relinquished a large part of what is now Iowa. Chief Black Hawk, who no longer had power after his capture during the Black Hawk War, camped with his remaining warriors high above the river at the present day Lindsay Park. And here we have a bird's eye view of Lindsay Park. We've only shifted slightly right because here is the village. And at Lindsay Park has some more history. Camp McLean. Here was located a military camp during the Civil War at which were trained more than half of the recruits from Iowa. In 1862, several hundred Sox Indians were imprisoned here following the Minnesota Massacre. From men living in caves within mounds to Indians being held prisoners, to volcanic massive fires, and underground tunnels being found below homes being built in the McLean Heights. The village of East Davenport and surrounding area is full of history and mystery. Let's move on to Sacred Heart Cathedral in Davenport, Iowa. Sacred Heart Cathedral, located in Davenport, Iowa, United States, is a Catholic cathedral and a parish church. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Places as part of the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Cathedral Complex. The parish traces its history back to 1856 when population growth in the city of Davenport led the Dubuque Diocese to establish a new parish on top of the hill on the east side of Davenport. And here we have Anton Leclerc again donating the parcel of land and funds to build the church. It is very nice of Anton because he also helped out St. Anthony's on 3rd and Main. Before this time, Parishioners attended St. Anthony's Church in downtown Davenport. On June 29, 1856, Bishop Matthias of Dubuque laid the cornerstone for the church. Anton Leclerc directed the construction of the church, which was named St. Margaret. The church was built of red brick in the Roman skew revival style. A frame rectory was built next to the church. It was moved to the back of the parish property in 1859, and a brick rectory replaced it. Once again, Anton Leclerc provided the money. Reverend Andrew Trevis was named the parish first pastor. In 1857, Reverend Henry Cosgrove was assigned to St. Margaret's after his ordination and became the pastor in 1861. He was destined to spend the rest of his life associated with the parish. 
During the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865, the Union Army established a headquarters in Davenport. There were five army camps in the city and four of them were within St. Margaret's Parish boundaries. An arsonist, who was never caught, set fire, you don't say, to the church on May 2nd, 1873. Damage was limited to the altar. A new altar was installed later that year with a painting of St. Margaret that now hangs in the present cathedral. Another criminal act affected the parish in the early hours of the morning on March 31, 1878, when two gunmen and a third individual attempted to rob the parish of a collection from the 40-hour devotion the night before. One of the gunmen shot at, but missed, Father Cosgrove, who was still in bed. They escaped without the collection, but with jewelry from the housekeeper's daughter. A $3,000 reward was offered and the three men were caught and sentenced to prison terms. In 1889, Bishop Cosgrove decided that a new, larger church should be built. The church property sits in a residential area where the city's Irish community resided from the 1850s to 1900. The initial planning of the new cathedral was carried out by Father Trevis, who was once again assigned to St. Margaret's after Cosgrove was named bishop. The assignment became too much for him, however, and he was replaced by Reverend James Davis. On April 27, 1890, the cornerstone for the new cathedral was laid. It was Father Trevis who suggested the parish's name change. He had visited Paray le Manuel in France, where St. Margaret Mary Alacoque had the vision of the Sacred Heart, which is a very interesting story in itself. The devotion was popular within St. Margaret's parish and Cosgrove also had a devotion to the Sacred Heart and had the image emblazoned on his coat of arms. The bishop requested permission from Pope Leo to name the new church Sacred Heart Cathedral. Lightning hit the building on August 20th, 1928, and that lightning sparked a fire between the slates of the roof and the ceiling. This caused extensive smoke and water damage to the church. A tornado also struck in Davenport on October 6, 2016, and it did some damage to the cathedral and the rectory. They were repaired along with several other Catholic churches in the city. I would assume that the blessing at Mass Mound by Mr. Charles was no longer valid. The parish school was established in 1859 in a frame building that was first used as the parish rectory. In September 1882, Bishop McMullen established St. Ambrose Seminary and Academy, now known as St. Ambrose University. And I wanted to keep the theme of the underground tunnels and caves, and I asked my friend, who used to go to St. Ambrose University, about the weirdest thing that he knew about St. Ambrose. And jokingly, I asked him about the underground tunnels, and he replied by saying the tunnels was the coolest thing, or the Ambrose Hall is haunted.
St. Ambrose University is a private Roman Catholic University in Davenport, Iowa. And at this point, I'm realizing the amount of Roman Catholicism within Davenport and how they immediately built so many churches and had schooling systems set up almost instantly and in my opinion maybe planned and quite the strategic plan and i do find that a little strange but sure i am a little strange saint ambrose was founded as a seminary and school of commerce for young men in 1882 known as saint ambrose academy it owes its beginning to the first bishop of Davenport, the most reverend John McMullen, which we've already discussed, who founded it under the auspices of the Diocese of Davenport. The affiliation remains strong today. For its first three years, classes were held in two rooms of the old saint, Margaret's School, located on the grounds of what is now Sacred Heart Cathedral. Bishop McMullen died in 1883, and Reverend A.J. was named the first president of St. Ambrose at the age of just 23. And I like to put a face to the name of this young gentleman at just age 23 becoming president of such a school but i could not find any and this is not him right here because the dates of birth do not line up the school was moved to locust street in 1885 where the central part of the present day ambrose hall was built located in a secluded grove of oak trees the site was far removed from the city that same year, St. Ambrose was incorporated as a literary, scientific, and religious institution. And here we have the St. Ambrose Hall with these large trees already around it and a dock leading to the steps that lead up to the second floor. I'm on the St. Ambrose University Archives on Facebook and we see the land for the proposed new St. Ambrose campus was a 10-acre tract owned by Henry G. Marquand of New York City. Marquand had purchased the land in 1855 from Adam and Susan Noel. And we can remember Adam because he built St. Anthony's downtown on 3rd and Main Street. The land was purchased for $4,000, apparently as an investment. Marquand was born in New York in 1819, and at an early age went to work in his family's jewelry business. When the business was sold, he entered real estate, became a Wall Street banker, and made a fortune speculating in foreign currency exchanges and European railroads. The question I could never answer was why did he buy 10 acres of land in Davenport, Iowa? And that is a very good question. I'm over here on the Facebook under St. Ambrose University Archives, and I noticed many men wearing these type of beanies. And I was wondering, and I came across a post. It says, It is the first day of classes. Welcome, fresh men. Aren't you glad that you don't have to wear the beanies? It used to be a St. Ambrose tradition for incoming freshmen to purchase a felt beanie. Incoming students were forced to wear the beanies so they could be identified as freshmen. If they were caught without the beanies, upperclassmen would punish them. Freshmen were made to count bricks on buildings or get down on all fours and bark like a dog. During World War II, changes began occurring at St. Ambrose. What had been a leisurely college, academic life became hurried as the war began affecting the campus. 
1942, the college announced that it would offer 40 new courses and that the college would be operated on a 12-month basis. Despite these changes, however, the student population at St. Ambrose was hard hit by the war. Universal draft regulations had taken a majority of the 18 to 22 year old male group which would normally have attended the college. In late April of 1942, it was announced that St. Ambrose would offer a new training program with the Navy being in June of 1943. In June of 1942, a civilian pilot training program opened. In preparation for the arrival of the Navy, St. Ambrose seminarians were moved to Loras College in Dubuque. The priest faculty also had to be relocated as the only official of the college allowed to be housed on campus during the Navy's presence was the college president. On June 1, 1943, Navy officials began arriving at the college to head the new V-12 program, which was to have a minimum of 300 trainees. Classes for the year resumed on July 1st and included such offerings as a aviation, military, science, and tactics, and advanced military science and tactics. The Navy remained at St. Ambrose College until October of 1945. And I've spent some time going through the St. Ambrose University archives and I came across this photo and it reads, Intro to Museum Studies from 1954 to 1955. Walzenbach served as a special agent of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps in Japan. He also took numerous photographs at the nuclear test site of Bikini Atoll. This photo is taken of men with the camera equipment used to capture photographs of the test site. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And let's have a closer look at this one. Just look at all these cameras. Not a weapon in sight, just an arsenal of cameras. I can't imagine what one of these cameras weighs, or what one would even cost. And from the amount of the camera gear, I would imagine a much larger camera crew to operate these ginormous story-telling devices. And every good story needs a director of photography. And what will this director of photography tell in his story.
There's lots of history here at St. Ambrose University. I haven't even skimmed the surface. There's more things I'd like to cover, but at 40 minutes, I believe I'm going to end the video now. I'll post a few more photos of the university, and as always, thanks for watching.